Hi, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Riverside Baptist Church. Grab your songbooks and we'll turn to page 402. Let's stand together as we sing all four verses of Footsteps of Jesus. or anything, 
please contact me or Mrs. Stevens. But we're so glad uh, that you're here this morning. God is so good. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, some of you read the bulletin last Sunday morning and this month, uh, this Sunday morning bulletin as well, that the annual revival meeting that we usually have starting in our anniversary has been canceled for this year. You say, well, people are coming to church. Why would you cancel a revival meeting? That's uh, people coming to church. They just come a little more often. I understand that. I probably should make something clear and hope that you will understand, and I think that you will. I invited a dear friend of mine, Brother Chris Staub. His sister Cheryl's been a member of our church since uh, she and her family, 1987. Uh, I've always enjoyed hearing Chris preach. And in the past, except the last, I don't know, three or four or so years, I've not been able to hear him preach when he would come down in January and February. Didn't he used to come in January? No, it's always been February, their anniversary. His anniversary. But uh, I've had him be able to help us with preaching from time to time over the years. But now that he comes in February, it presents a problem because of the missions conference. But I really enjoy hearing that man preach. So he and I talked a long time ago about him coming. This was before the virus. And uh, I've been praying about what to do, so we have made arrangements for him to come as our guest revival preacher. And then a couple of weeks ago, I'm not running scared, do not misunderstand, but I just thought Chris has had a bout with cancer. I think this, Cheryl, you gotta help me now. It may have been 10 years ago that he developed some cancer. I think he had a surgery. I'm not sure if he had surgery. I know he's had experimental uh, treatment and it has worked. Okay. All right, when you have cancer cells in your body, your immune system is somewhat compromised, some more than others. And I got to thinking about that. So we were going to have Chris and his wife fly down from the Detroit area. I haven't been on an airplane in some time now. Uh, some people don't want to go on airplanes. I understand the prices are real low. They're trying to get passengers, and uh, the seats are going for bargain prices. Doesn't include seatbelt. That's uh, another hundred percent, I guess. <laughs> Just a little humor there, kind of light and low. But uh, they charge you everything else. But nevertheless, uh, to get them down here. I, I was just disturbed by it. It just bothered me. I didn't have any peace because now I'm asking him in particular to uh, commit himself to the possibility of this uh, virus. So having no peace, I talked to him about a week and a half ago. I said, we need to talk about this. I said, I'm not, I am concerned about you. Please don't misunderstand. But uh, I'm more concerned about him in the travel situation. Right. And I said, I don't have peace. His response was so gracious. Pastor, if you don't have peace, I don't have peace. If you have peace about me coming, I have peace about me coming. What an attitude. Amen. That's just great. Amen. I said, Chris, let's postpone it. I, I, I don't want to jeopardize you. And he thanked me. He said, I really hadn't thought about that. But he said, if you have peace about what we should not do, then let's not do it. So see if you can get him to come down at least the last Sunday in January, and then we can have him preach. <laughs> if he's going to come, that's on him. And uh, tell him to come for the last Sunday, then he can preach here. And then we go into missions conference. Now, one other announcement. Don't raise your hands. Don't be bothered by this. How many of you are going to heaven? You don't have to raise your hands. If you're saved, you are. Where is heaven? Well, I can tell you where it is. <laughs> I want to give a message tonight, probably next Sunday night as well, because I think I need two times of this. What is the intermediate heaven? I've never heard of such a thing. I know most of 
most people have it. But there is a statement in your bulletin on a scripture reading and then morning worship psalms, instrument solo, and above that, Sunday evening message from the Revelation 21, verses 1, 2, and 3. What is a new heaven? What is a new earth? Well, we already have a heaven. Why do we need a new heaven? What is new anyway? A couple of words in the language in which the Bible is written to the pen that will give you some kind of information there. A new heaven. Well, if we're going home to be in heaven, are you sure it's your permanent home? Well, yes. Heaven's permanent. Are you sure about that? Is heaven permanent? Well, there's always been heaven. Are you sure about that? Just a preacher. Uh, use an old fashioned expression. You're rattling my chain now. You get me upset. Good. See you tonight at 6 o'clock. And uh, we will approach a couple of these subjects before I take you to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 in about uh, maybe two or three Sunday nights because these messages are designed to lead us in to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the first eight verses, so that you'll have a better understanding of what Paul is writing about as we go through the book of 2 Corinthians and especially in chapter 5. Never fear. I am excited about it. <laughs> and if I can get excited about it, maybe I can get you excited about it. Amen. So we'll have prayer and you will consider being here at 6 o'clock tonight. Amen. Father in heaven, oh how I thank thee for thy book. The precious word of God. I thank thee that it's seeing us through life and it's going to take us right on into eternity based on all that thou hast given us. And therefore, we stand before thee justified by faith in thy Son with great and precious promises for the future. So we know that when our term in this life is over, we're going to be with thee in heaven. And we want to know more about it. So open scripture, open our thinking, and let's examine what great things thou hast prepared for us. And Lord, I wish I could just go through a whole series on heaven, but maybe just a couple of messages to get us ready for 2 Corinthians. So you bless us this morning. We've gathered around the word of God. We're worshiping thee, and we want to hear what thou dost have to say about the, the greatness and the authority, the power of thy son. And then tonight, the heaven that he has prepared for us for a while. And then a new heaven and a new earth. Thank you in the Savior's name for your blessings. Amen. Amen. God is good. Amen. Amen. Oh, he's also great. Page 38. How great thou art. We'll sing the first, the third, and the fourth verse of how great thou art. Let's stand one last time before our scripture reading today. How great thou art.
turn your Bibles, please, to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. Beginning in verse 89. And the word of the Lord says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Amen. Thy faithfulness is unto all generations. Thou hast established the earth, and it abideth. They continue this day according to thine ordinances, for all are thy servants. Unless thy law had been my delights, I should, I should then have perished in mine affliction. I will never forget thy precepts, for with them thou hast quickened me. I am thine, save me, for I have sought thy precepts. The wicked have waited for me to destroy me, but I will consider thy testimonies. I have seen an end of all perfection, but thy commandment is exceeding broad. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thou art truly God. Who, who else can say, thy word is forever settled? Lord, you speak, and it is true. You speak, and things happen. Lord, things are done in accordance to all that is said by you accordance to your will. Lord, we are truly grateful that thou art the only true and powerful living God. Lord, we come before you today to hear your word. Lord, we come to understand it. Lord, we come to know you through your word. Lord, we come to please you by understanding and acting upon your word. Lord, we ask now as our pastor brings forth your word, Lord, that there be no interruption no obstacles. Lord, let it be with great joy that our pastor speaks from your word. Lord, that you'll give him great confidence, knowing it is your word. Lord, we pray that you would move in, your, in our hearts, Lord, as we hear your word. Lord, grant us understanding in accordance to your word. And Lord, help us in all that we say and do, that we honor and glorify you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
1997. Walking with the Lord.
chapter 28. Two more messages to come, one this morning, one next Sunday morning, from this wonderful book according to Matthew. Chapter 28, please. Verses 16, 17, and 18 I want to read for this morning. I'm glad that we sang that song a little while ago. The greatness of our Savior, how great thou art. None, none compare to him. Allah cannot compare. Allah is a, the moon god of the Arabic Arish tribe of centuries ago. That's where Allah came from. Now our God, by the way, is eternal. Amen. That means there's no beginning, there's no ending, just the present. He said, I can't grasp that. Well, neither can I. There are a lot of things in life I can't grasp. It doesn't mean I'm a denier because my puny brain cannot realize it, rationalize it, understand it. Oh my. What an idiot I would be. So there are many things in the Word of God that I cannot really understand. But I'm interested in the message tonight. So again, I want to call it to your attention and invite you to be here. But presently, it's Matthew chapter 28, verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubt. And Jesus came and spake to them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Why is it that some Christian people do not progress in their Christian faith? Over the years, I've had people, not many, less than I can count, I hope, on one hand, who have said something to this effect. In fact, quoting one man almost verbatim, he said, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, and that's all that counts. And I've met some other Christians that had the same attitude. Now, I can't judge anyone's salvation. Man looketh upon the outward appearance, the Bible says. God looketh upon the heart. I don't see hearts. I say that once in a while. I want you to keep it in mind, because I'm keeping it in mind. Therefore, the way you and I live before each other matters. It matters as to our testimony for Christ. And that's why we're still here. We're to bear a testimony of Christ. Amen. Amen. When God is finished with our testimony, he's going to call us home. Yesterday, I was talking to a dear friend of mine who once was a pastor. He's a little bit older than I am. He's now been placed in a, a home for not preachers, but just a home for two or three men that need a place to live because they have no one to take care of them. And when he calls me, we talk quite often. He keeps reminding me, and now you're going to have my funeral. You don't want to ever forget that. I said, well, you're not going to let me forget it, Bill. He said, no, I'm not going to let you forget it. And uh, he said, uh, I know you're going to do a good job. I said, who cares? You're not going to be there anyway. <laughs> and he'll laugh. And it's kind of not incredulous laugh, naturally, but a joyful laugh. If you someday come to my funeral, uh, don't be concerned about, well, I sure hope this would please the pastor. It won't make a bit of difference. I'm not going to be here anyway. So if you don't come, it won't matter. I'm going to be with the Lord. Amen. And when you have finished with this life and God has called you home, you're going to be with the Lord. Amen. Jesus referred one time to the disciples as being of little faith. Oh, ye of little faith. What does little mean? That means not very strong, very weak faith. So many Christians are clinging to this life as though, oh boy, this is it. And then there's the hereafter. Oh, no, no. No, real life is to come. I don't know what you want to call this life. In fact, sometimes I've referred to it as pre-life because real life is on the horizon. And every day it's 24 hours closer on the horizon. Some people just trust in Christ alone, and they think that that is sufficient. Now, you have to really carefully listen to me. I'm not trying to talk you out of being saved. That's a silly thought that can be done. What I'm saying is there are people who make professions of faith, 
And by the way, they, I was going to say live, but let me change that. By the way, they do not live for Christ. You wonder, don't you? How can you be saved and not love the Lord? How can you be saved and not love God's word? How can you be saved and not love God's people? Yeah. Don't you realize what a great Savior we have? Amen. And he, he requires, yea, he commands our love and our affection and our Amen. worship of him. Amen. Uh, some people go with Christ only so far. And they've just made up their minds. Um, with my life, my life is my life. No, no, when you're saved, my life is his life. Your life is his life. I belong to him. The song there said, <clears throat> now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me. Not for the years of time alone, and they do, but for all eternity. Amen. Mm. So the 11 disciples who were from Galilee, except for one, and he's no longer one of the group, they were all Galileans. They lived in a part of the country that was called Galilee in those days of the Gentiles. Now, there are Jewish people that lived there. It's Jewish land. But there were a lot of Gentiles in the northern part of the country. And those who lived in the southern part of the country thought themselves, I think, a little more closer to God than those up north. That's why the expression is used in John, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? That's what's up north. Pardon the expression, I don't mean it like you may think of it. It just comes to mind. That's what's a hick town. That's a, it's a town for nobodies. Nobody important ever comes out of that. And yet this disciple to be found out differently. God himself, incarnated in the person of Jesus, Amen. came out of that little hick town. And so Jesus had told him before he was crucified that after I'm risen from the dead, the not over the heads, after I'm risen from the dead, I'll meet you in Galilee. And now that he has risen from the dead, he comes to mind. He makes some appearances. In fact, if you calculate the days, I may be off a day or two, it's been probably about two weeks since his resurrection. And they've made it to Galilee. That would take them some four or five days. I guess if you rode an animal, you might move a little bit faster. But they didn't probably have enough money to hold animals. But nevertheless, they could walk in about four or five days. Because you're only talking about maybe 80, 85, possibly 90 miles. And where are you going up in Galilee? So they're going to slowly make their way back to to their old stomping grounds, if I can use a colloquialism. They knew the place. It's not mentioned by name, but they, they knew where he was talking about. Could it have been where the Sermon on the Mount was given? I don't know. But nevertheless, he said to be there. He'd meet them. Now he's already met them for a couple of weeks or so. And he's, he's gone again. You see, he came and went. And that always amazed me. They never figured it out. And you don't have to figure out miracles. Just trust that the God of all creation can do anything he wants to do. And in this glorified body, Jesus would present himself. You mean, you mean he materialized? Yeah, I don't care if you want to use that word, I don't care. So he materialized and then he went his way. And then he would show up again, like at the seashore of Galilee. And they would have breakfast together. So they're going to make it up to Galilee. And there they'll meet where they were accustomed to meeting. And they'll wait. And he will come. Just like you and I are waiting night, a nap, and he's coming. Secondly, in verse 17, when they saw him, they worshiped. Now this implies that they're going to fall on their faces. Have you ever been so in love with the Lord? Have you ever been so burdened that you needed to really trust in God? And you not only prayed, you not only sat and prayed, you not only got down on your knees and prayed, but you spread yourself out on the floor and you prayed. 
full oh, for a blessing from God. And so they bow before him. I think they behold him by the feet. There was an oriental custom, and they're prostrate before him. Now, some of them are weak. Some are confused. Some have some misgivings. Some have some fears. And some have some doubts. Because it's mentioned in verse 17, when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Now let me see if I can help us to understand this as best I think I've understood it from the scripture. They doubted. Did they doubt that it was him? No. Did they doubt that he was real? No. I told you it already appeared to them several times down in the southern part of the country. In fact, he had appeared on the second Sunday night to the one disciple that missed church on the first Sunday night. You know, wait, wait a minute, how did he miss church? Well, that's what Jesus found, it was the church. Now they didn't have maybe the organization that you and I have, they didn't have a location like you and I have a location. But they met together, and that's what a church does, it meets together. And so Thomas has come down to us as the doubting disciple. So we refer to him as Doubting Thomas. And often when we do that, even as preachers, it's as though Thomas should never have done that. That was a mistake on his part, lack of faith, as though we would never have done that. And Jesus revealed himself to Thomas. And whether Thomas reached out and touched him as Jesus said, do this, he had already said to the other disciples, the spirit hath not flesh and bone as you see me have, because they thought it was some kind of a ghost. He wasn't real. And he said, The spirit hath not flesh and bone, as you see me have. And then they touched him. And then, according to 1 John chapter 1, they handled him. They put their hands, if you please, all over his body. They, they were able to, to squeeze in on him, if you like, I think. And, and then they knew it was him. This is no spirit. This is no disembodied ghost of a person. This is. This is the real Christ. He's the same, but he's not the same. He shows up where he desires, and then he leaves, and we'd like to trail right after him, but he's gone all of a sudden, and there's no way to keep up with him. But that's in his glorified body, which, by the way, he has taken back into heaven, and shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. Some doubted. Did they doubt that, that he had arisen from the dead? No, they didn't doubt that either. He's there. Did they doubt that th this is not this is not the same Jesus? Oh, it's the same Jesus. Just with, with different God attitudes that he had voluntarily set aside when he came. To the womb of Mary. He humbled himself. And all that means when Paul wrote about it was that the prerogatives of glory of all creation that belonged to him, for without him nothing was made that was made, he set them aside so that he could come and be born like you and I were born and he could live like you and I lived and always, always, always yet without sin, the scripture says. So I kind of differ with the theologians, which is okay, because they have a right to be wrong. <laughs> they say uh, uh, he was perfect man, all man. No, no, except for the exception of our nature. He took upon himself our nature, but not our sinful nature. He could be at all points, as the writer said, tempted like as we are, yet without sin. He did not have a sinful nature. He is the sinless, always has been and will be naturally, Son of God. Amen. So, what did they doubt? Well, let me make some suggestions for you. I copied out some verses I wanted to read. For example, 
In John chapter 15, verse 16, Jesus said to these men on the night of his betrayal, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. Surely they, they listened. In chapter 17 of John, same time frame. As thou hast sent me, he's praying for his men into the world. Even so have I also sent them into the world. Did they not remember that? Now, if their conscience and their conflicts were working, and they had a bad conscience toward Gentiles, they would have thought, okay, he's uh, sent us to our own Jewish people, and, and we're a witness to the Jewish people. But I don't think so. He has the world in mind. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I think it's the same world in that what we call high priestly prayer in chapter 17 of John. So he says, and in their presence they hear him say, I have also sent them into the world. Now it's a past tense there. But they're not in the world yet. They're not out there among Jews, okay. They're not out there especially among Gentiles. In fact, it will take a while before the early church gets a little bit organized. And it will take a few years before Peter is emboldened enough by special miracles sent to him from God to go to the Gentiles, like Cornelius in particular, and witness to him and win him to Christ. And Peter balked and delayed and... and uh, and went around in circles, if you please, for quite a number of years before that church really reached out to the Gentiles. They knew what their command was. They knew it. In fact, Jesus is going to give it to them again. He's going to say in verse 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Nations is the word ethnos, which means ethnic groups. Look, there's one. I'm a racist. Because there's one race. Amen. Amen. So call me a racist if you care. I, I couldn't care less. It doesn't matter. I'm in the human race. Now there are ethnic groups in this human race. And that's what Jesus said in verse 19 of Matthew 28. You go and you teach all ethnic groups. Everywhere you go. But that's for next Sunday morning. Let's get back to where we are now. There would be, however, danger. So I'm going again to the 16th chapter of John now, and I'll read a couple of verses. He is telling them what's going to happen. He's telling them on the night of the betrayal. He's sharing his heart with them. He's sharing his ministry with them because they're going to pick up where, when I say he left off, he's never left off. God's never been unconcerned. But as far as his earthly ministry, he's going to leave it. He's going back to be with the Father. Listen to what he says to these men. These things have I spoken unto you, that you should not be offended. Now it has a different meaning than what we else normally attach in our PC culture of offense. It means to be entrapped. And this is what he followed up with. He's talking to these men. They shall put you out of the synagogue. That's the last thing they wanted. Oh my. I mean, you, you were divorced from Jewish life then because life revolved around the synagogue. And everybody went to the synagogue. It's just a gathering together place. That's all it means. It's not necessarily the temple. All the little towns could have synagogues. In the Gentile world, the Jews could have synagogues. Still do today. They shall put you out of the synagogues. You'll be disenfranchised. You'll be persona non gratia. Yea, oh, listen to this one. They're listening to it. The time cometh, therefore, that whosoever killeth you 
will think that he doeth God service. Now, can you understand why, taking us back to chapter 20 of Matthew, they all worshipped him, but some had doubts. Oh, good Lord. What are we going to do next? What's next on the agenda? What's he going to ask of us next? They already knew what he wanted. He had told them two weeks prior. And now they're concerned. Folks, come back. He said we could be put out of the synagogue. He said we could be killed. They could crucify us. Oh, thoughts about the kingdom. All of a sudden, I don't think they're too interested in the kingdom as they were throughout the three years of being with him. Always the kingdom. Lord, we're going to help us time. Kingdom, kingdom, kingdom. And the responsibility that we're going to have the kingdom. The high positions of power that we're going to have in the kingdom because we've given up our lives to go with him and, and he's the king and he's going to bring in the kingdom and, and then it all collapsed. So you can see why they're weak, some of them. They're confused. They have misgivings. They have fears. And now, now they doubt. I think they're doubting the assignment that's been given to them. If he's not going to stay with them, he hasn't yet. He's there, he's gone. He's there the next day, he's gone. He meets with them, he meets with 500 brethren at one time, and then he's gone. He has breakfast with them, and he's gone. They're used to having him there all the time. If any trouble developed, they depended on him. He'll intercede, he'll take care of the problems. But then came the crucifixion. And then came the resurrection. And then came the assurance, the confirmation that this is the same Christ with, with different power. Power that we've never known. Well, I would think that when they saw the dead raised by Christ, that was pretty strong power. So now... He still wants us to go. Is this why we're here? Well, the next Sunday morning, he's going to pardon me colloquialism again. He's going to lay it on again. He's going to one more time tell him what to do. And, and that, that won't be the last time. We're going to hear it again. This is their task. I think that's why they doubted. I think they said to themselves, some of them, I, I, I can't handle this. I'm not capable of this. He's always taking care of everything. And now he's going to leave this group of us to ourselves. This, 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 this church, this gathering, we've depended upon him and he's gone. And he wants us to take up where he's going to leave off. Is that why we have verse 18? I think so. That's why we have it. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. All power. The word here is not the power that is used in Romans 1.16, the power of the gospel. There is the word that, and you don't translate it like this in your thinking, it, it's not really going to work. Uh, it's the word that it gives us in English uh, dynamo and dynamite you know boom power uh, that's what the gospel does it has the power it just upturns your life overturns your life it changes your life okay that's not the power here this is another word it means authority all authority now he does have all power but here it's all authority. All, listen to what he said in Matthew eleven twenty seven. All things are delivered unto me of my Father. What's all things? Well, it's, it's uh, all things. All things are delivered unto me of my Father. 
And no man knoweth the son but the father. And therefore the father knows exactly in whom he has invested all authority. Neither knoweth any man the father save the son, and he to whom serve the son will reveal him. He has power. What kind of power? How about John 10, 18? No man taketh my life from me, but I lay it down of myself. Well, they killed him on the cross. No, they never killed him. He gave them his life. And he gave his life for the sins of mankind. Can't leave me. But I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it again. And again, in the resurrection. This commandment have I received of my Father. I think they're doubtful of the future. I think they're doubtful of their part in the future ministry of the Son of God. It's not over. Oh no, it's just, the ministry is just beginning. And here it is this morning. It's extended all these centuries to where we are now. And how far in the future it will extend, I do not know. That's in the plan of God. They've chosen the fruitfulness. He prayed for them to bring forth fruit. He warned of the dangers. And now he's reassuring them that all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. In heaven. In earth. In hell, over men, angels, demons, including all this time and life and death and eternity and salvation, all of that is belonging to him. He has power. He has authority over all. And just when puny man thinks he's in charge, <laughs> just chuckle. Say, well, he just told me here. And he can know. And he can know from carrying the gospel. During his earthly ministry, he had authority over disease and sickness and death itself. And except for the forgiveness of sins, which no man can have that authority, but he claimed it because he had the right to claim it. He is God. He left that to himself. But to the disciples, he had given them authority. And they were fine as long as he was nearby, just in case anything didn't work out. And sometimes it didn't. But he was there. And now he's going to leave. He is the Lord of heaven and earth. Oh my. They're in the presence of the Lordship of the Son of God. Jesus said in John chapter 5, For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. I noticed some things I wanted to share with you quickly as I close. He has all the power over principalities and powers and the rulers of this darkness and this world against spiritual wickedness in high places. They all bow to him. Every, everyone is held in check by him. Men may overrule the affairs of nations and peoples. They may drive them to distress. They may bring panic and woe and all kinds of difficulties upon them. They may incite men to war. They may bind people to lust. Men may bring youth under the influence of drugs and dominate their lives for the rest of their existence upon this earth. Men may blind other adults with delusions of grandeur and materialism. They may hinder the work of God as it goes out through our missionaries and through us here at home. They may, as Jesus said, sow wheat and tares and tares among the wheat. They may rage at him. They may deny him. They may curse him. They may use his name in blasphemy, but they will only go so far. Well, how much farther can they go? I don't know, but they're trying here in America. I won't get off on this very far, but just, just a tangent, if you please. There is a war going on for the soul of America. From a political sense, I understand. And an economic sense, I understand that. There's also a war going on for the soul of America, morally and spiritually. It's a battle. It's never been in my existence as hot as it is now. And don't put a lot of faith in those who 
pledge allegiance to the Bible and put their hand upon the Bible and pledge allegiance even to the Constitution. Uh, sometimes it means nothing. Right. Yeah. There are those who want to, they want to dethrone God and, and enthrone man. It's called humanism. Right. Man is the master of all things. Man's just a puny creation that he's called himself to be before God. Man is not in charge. And they boast about being in charge. We want our power. Jesus said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Kingdoms wax and wane. Empires rise and fall. Nations come and go. Generations appear and then they disappear all according to the permissive will of God. I cannot explain to you his omniscience and how it permits all of this to happen and why. I can't explain it. I just know that he is still God and he's still on the throne. He's going to have his will done. He is omnipotent and nothing will hinder his power. Though heaven and earth were to come against him, <coughs> it would be as nothing. He is King of Kings. He is Lord of Lords. And this lowly peasant from Nazareth, without money, without political machinery and connections, without an army, still commands. and conquers numerous souls. Amen. I have been conquered. Stand with me for prayer. I am one who has lost my life in him, but never really. I've just found it. And I've found it in him. Maybe now you can understand in this attitude of prayer my excitement about the Word of God, the great truths and the promises therein, the fact that someday I'm going to be with Him, and the sooner the better. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Come quickly. Father in heaven, I don't know if someone in this audience needs to be saved. They need to be born again by the power of the one who has all authority to forgive sins and grant everlasting life. May their souls be conquered. May those who have listened and watched via the streaming realize just who this individual is who says all power is given on May someone trust in Christ here or someone else, somewhere else. I pray in the Savior's name. Now heads are still bowed. Have you ever come to Christ? Do you realize you can grow up in a Christian home and never be born again? I have known two preachers in my lifetime, two pastors, one of them I did not know personally, but I met him a couple of times. And I heard him preach after he got saved. He said, uh -huh. I've known two preachers that pastored churches and have never been saved. Independent Baptist churches. They just came to realize one day I grew up under Christian influence but I never saw myself as a sinner in need of a Savior. I just assumed that he was my Savior. And I asked him to come into my heart and give me eternal life. And, but I never even repented. How about you? In the announcement this morning, I said, are you sure you're going to have a Other people talking about it once in a while, but everybody's going. He has all power. Church has no power. Church provides an opportunity 
to present to those who are willing to hear of the one who has all power. That's what we do. We who have been conquered by his power, but well, we want to know more about him. Because we're going to be with him forever. And we'd like to learn as much as we can. And for you who are not saved, he has all power. Your church, your denomination, your pastor, your priest, they have no power. It resides all in him. This is the last verse she'll play. Pastor, I'm coming this morning. I want to make sure I'm saved. I'm, I'm not sure. But the Lord wants you to be sure you come to trust Christ. He shed his blood for you. He rose again from the dead for you and me. And he's coming again for us. Pastor Stevens will close our service with a prayer.